Um, so I'm going to let James expand on that a lot more, but he's going to talk to you about actual agroforestry rather than the incorporation of farm woodlands onto farms. Simply increase the live weight gain of livestock. Um, for every degree of temperature outside of uh, its optimum, whether it's above or below, uh, livestock take um, kind of four to five percent more feed just to maintain their live weight, let alone gain any. Um, if you're having to supplement feed to your livestock during poor weather, that really can stack up quite substantially. Um, living barns are also brilliant during uh, lambing and uh, things like that. Lamb mortality rates, uh, yeah, lamb mortality rate increases, decreases. They die less by about 30% during uh, lambing if you do it in a well sheltered area. It means you can lamb outside, less time in the shed, less spread of disease. It's a more natural kind of, it's just a more pleasant environment quite frankly. Um, that does need to be coupled up with the right breeds, obviously. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of about it for living barns. Uh, I'm going to, but as um, Peter said, I'm going to uh, talk a bit more about agroforestry. Um, and I'm going to touch a bit upon some, it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour of different styles and designs of systems, um, as well as some of the things that will be kind of uh, funded through the agroforestry ELM scheme, which will be coming out next year. Um, very briefly, I am James Ramson Gardner. I'm the National Agroforestry Advisor for the Forestry Commission. Um, my main roles are to kind of upskill uh, and support the forestry and farming sectors in England to do agroforestry, um, as well as working with DEFRA to design and create the grants and regulations to manage it, and lots of other little bits and bobs. But those are the, the two main core aspects. Um, so, why agroforestry? Um, well, effectively, trees, woodlands uh, and forestry can play a massive supporting role to the farm. Um, and I think that word supporting is really key there. We're not looking to replace the farm. Um, there's been quite a lot of bad press over the last few years of some farms being bought up and completely planted and taken out of the rural economy. Uh, so I think it's really important to stress that we're looking to support them, not replace them. Um, the main driver for any kind of tree-based system on a farm should be led by the farmer. You know, it's, it's their land, they know it far better than, than we will, and they'll know what's kind of what elements their farm business, whether it's livestock or arable or horticultural, could, you know, need support. Um, and the, you know, government funding behind agroforestry and woodland creation, a lot of it is focused on carbon sequestration, which is really important. It's a really valuable, uh, you know, asset. It's really, really worthwhile thing to do. Um, but I wouldn't go into designing a system with that in mind. Those are just, that's a natural byproduct that we will get through putting a well-designed system in. So don't, don't worry about trying to max, you'll get that. Let's focus on what you need and what you can get from a, an agroforestry system. Um, and it can be as simple as uh, you've got an existing hedgerow with, you know, if you're lucky, uh, a veteran tree every 50, 100 meters. Um, it could be as simple as just planting far more trees into that hedgerow. It could be as little as that, you know, and you'd gain, you'd get really great benefit from that. Um, but obviously, I'm going to talk about all the other really exciting designs, which you cannot see on that at all. Um, so I'll very briefly describe them. God, that is poor. Um, so agroforestry is a really big spectrum. You know, it's a fancy buzzword that's been floating around now for the last few years and kind of getting more mainstream. As a, as a named concept, it's maybe about 30 years old, um, but it effectively just means farming with trees. And it's something humans have done for thousands of years ever since we started clearing woodlands for agriculture. Um, we just haven't done much of it in the last 100 years in this country. So it starts off with just trees and a hedgerow. I promise you that's what that drawing is. Um, and then it goes on to what we think of as agroforestry hedgerows. So they're basically they're wider, you're looking maybe six, six meters wide. You've got a line of trees down the middle and your hedgerow species either side. Um, and then you've got shelter belts, which Pete has already touched on a little bit. Um, kind of scattered tree planting, something you might see in like a parkland setting, you might have seen already. Um, they're more uniform, uh, kind of lower and higher density uh, plantings of trees in fields, whether those are scattered, in rows. Uh, the main reason you really put them into rows is to be able to manage the land underneath easier. So that's whether you're getting hay cuts uh, or managing an arable crop under there. Um, wood pasture systems, uh, which are currently already funded by Natural England, 
these are, they can look quite attractive on the face of it. They've got really high payment rates, uh, one of the highest in natural England, I believe. Um, but that rate is high because you're massively restricted in the amount of livestock you can have in that system. That's why the rate's high, because they're paying you not to have as many cattle or sheep there as you could do. Um, and then uh, we've got riparian uh, corridor buffers, which are covered in the woodland creation, and kind of small field corners, small farm woodlands, all stuff Pete has covered. Um, so I'm going to touch on a, little, on a handful of these uh, slightly more obtuse designs uh, compared to some of the more standard uh, woodland creation stuff we've uh, already talked about. So I'm going to be using this uh, anonymous farm somewhere in the country. Um, so we're going to be looking at this five hectare intensively managed field. And I'm just going to run through uh, a couple of different design ideas. Um, I has, I'd really like to stress these are just ideas. They are not strict. They are not uniform. You will work and design the scheme that will fit your farm and landscape best. These are purely ideas and starting points. So we start with hedgerows, uh, something we're all very, very familiar with. Um, there's nothing rocket science behind a hedgerow. They're really great. They're great at windbreaks for shade and shelter, and they can really massively increase the amount of trees we have in our landscape without losing any acreage. Where I think things get interesting is where we're a lot of farmers are moving into a more rotational grazing system. Hedgerows can play a really good part in creating those paddocks. So you've got day paddocks, couple of day paddocks, Hedgerows are a great way of doing that, of you get your fencing in to differentiate, but as well as increasing the kind of corridors that you have, uh, as well as all that extra shade and shelter. Uh, that same concept goes across to the, the kind of wider agroforestry hedges. We don't really have an exciting name for those yet. Sometimes we call them chunky. I don't know if that's a, a politically correct term to describe a hedgerow. Um, but they provide exactly the same thing. You just get a bit more for it. And what I really like about it is that the core timber species you've got down the middle, you could actually grow for usable timber on the farm, whether that's purely just firewood for the, for the farmhouse, or if you've got enough of it, potentially a little sideline in a firewood business, uh, or just chip to, to keep the biomass going, um, or chip for, for bedding. Um, I, that's why I really like it, is that you, get, you can get a product out of it, as well as having uh, kind of edible species on either side of the hedgerow for, for livestock to browse. Um, the, th edit, the last thing about them, sorry, the extra thickness of them, so you're looking, you know, that kind of six to eight metre wide, um, it's great for biosecurity. Um, I've worked with a farmer in Northumberland who did a similar system to this all the way around the boundary of their farm to protect their pedigree herd from potential TB crossover from neighbouring farms, just prevents any of that nose to nose uh, touching. Um, it's always, always a good thing to increase. Um, so a more kind of a slightly irregular planting system within the field, if you can see here, um, along the field, uh, along the edge of this northern edge here, you've got a more dense planting, um, and then that effectively kind of uh, graduates out to less and less. Um, what you can't see here, sorry, is the additional fencing to create these into rotational grazing paddocks. By doing this, in every paddock, you have got plenty of open grazing ground, but also shelter and shade for the livestock. Makes it a lot more, excuse me, a lot more democratic for the, the livestock to effectively choose where they want to be on any given day. It's great for animal welfare, um, and all that shade and shelter obviously helps increase live weight gain. Um, there's a, a really interesting uh, professor for the Organic Research Centre called Lindsay Winstance, who uh, has got a, uh, a cow stress test and it's effectively how close you can get to a cow before it starts moving away from you determines how stressed or relaxed that animal is. In an open field, it averages out about 15 meters before, uh, sorry, 14 meters before it starts moving away. Within trees or a sheltered system, you can get as close as four meters, you know, as a, just as a demonstrator, just how it improves that animal's welfare. Um, so quality timber from a grazed woodland. Um, contrary to some of the uh, advice and paperwork we've actually got next door, uh, I'm a really big believer in grazed woodlands. Um, I'm not talking in the few percent of ancient woodlands we have in the country. I'm not talking there. I'm also not talking about set stock grazing where livestock are in there all year round. But there are definitely times and ways we can increase livestock into our woodlands for the benefit of the woodland as well as the benefit for the livestock. 
But in those systems, we can also grow really quality hardwood timber, which is something we are climatically perfect for in this country, but is not something we've really practiced for, for a few decades now. Um, you could look to get a good uh, quality product out of 40 to 80 years, depending what species and where you are. Um, and it could be as simple as just planting initially at two and a half thousand hectares, which is what you can do in Yuko. You start pruning those trees from year four to keep that formative growth. You know, you want good, nice, clean, straight bowls. You start thinning the system from year 11. And then once the obligation period is over, year 15, you could start introducing grazing. And you basically continue that through. You keep thinning every few years, increase your know, managing the light down to the grass sward underneath. Um, and you can get usable grazing ground as well as a productive crop out of that. Um, I've seen some really lovely examples of this actually up in the Highlands in Scotland, um, where it's, it's, it's not on ground you thought you'd get something good from, but they're growing some really quality silver birch. Um, so a regular tree system, you know, I say regular because it's, it's literally trees planted on a grid. Um, it, it can look odd at first in a landscape. You can see, I hope you can make that out. You can see this farm here. Um, I believe this is in the uplands as well, actually. Um, they have uh, planted these squares, uh, these grid squares, to provide shade and shelter for their livestock, but not across the entirety of the, the grazing. Um, with, I'm going to touch on this a bit later, the main management priority for any agroforestry system is pruning. If you don't prune it, it's not going to work. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, we are really trying to balance on a knife edge here the growth of the tree, but also the growth of your grazing or your arable crop. Now, I'm focusing mostly on grazing. We're in the uplands. We're in the northwest. We're not really talking about arable a huge amount. Yeah. But all these principles to grass equally apply to arable crops. Um, so the pruning of the system, God, it's getting, can't even see that anymore. Um, the pruning of the system is uh, really, really important. And then, so this does, after all that, this does talk a little bit about arable, mostly because I just wanted to demonstrate, if you can see that, if the trees are in a row, effectively, not on a spaced out grid. Um, these are, again, as I said, these are ideas. They are not set in stone. You can absolutely have trees in a row, you can have them scattered, you can have them clumped, however you like them, you can have them. Um, the, I, the real benefit of a row-based system is for managing the ground underneath. It's easier to fence, you don't have to individually guard trees, you can just fence individual rows. You can um, uh, cut a uh, hay, a hay cut between the rows or an arable crop. Um, it's just, it's very workable and to be honest, I can see there being a lot of uptake of this kind of system when the grant launches. Um, less formal scatter, uh, kind of scattered approach is just what I said, it's kind of similar number of trees but they are just scattered all over the place. This could be, this could work really, really well when we're looking to plant in more sensitive landscapes, you know, whether in a national park or an AOMB, you know, places that have a more you know, have more of a say-so on the landscape. That landscape character is really important. These kind of more scattered informal approaches could really work there, as well as gaining that, that benefit for your, for your farming system. Um, they're also really good for biodiversity. Most of these, I would argue, are great for biodiversity, but the more natural you can make it, the better, effectively. And then we go on to pruning. Um, Helpfully, I put a nice lot of pictures in here to demonstrate the benefits of pruning, and you can't really see them. So you're gonna to have to trust me, pruning's great. This is in Northern Ireland. Um, these are rows of improved cherry that have been planted. Uh, they're planted quite close. The rows are only 14 meters apart, which is getting, you know, it's getting pretty close. Um, but they have formatively pruned those trees from about year three. Uh, and that just means every year going along and pruning any branches before they get thicker than my thumb. That's really when you want to be pruning stuff before it gets thicker than that. Because if it gets thicker than that, you're looking at more uh, potential kind of d disease entry points, more of a knot forming in the timber. And when there's a knot, it goes from the outside all the way through to the core. So the, knot, the, the less knots you can have in the timber, the more valuable effectively it is. Um, but this, so it's a close row, but they pruned it and managed it properly. So there's only a 10 meter strip between the trees that they can uh, get a productive agricultural crop from. 
and that's exactly what they do. It's, a, it's on a rotational system of arable and pasture, um, and it's, they've had absolutely no issues. They've had no decrease in yields. Um, if anything, things have improved. Um, and then this uh, is a, one of the most um, established agroforestry systems we have in England. Uh, so this is on a farm down in Berkshire, and these are trees planted in rows, exactly the same spacing as the cherry, 14 metres apart, but it's 30 years old, and it's a mixture of timber trees and amenity trees, so they grow lots of really odd species to, to a kind of semi-standard size, and then sell them on, so they dig the whole tree out and sell them on to, to parks and gardens and things like that. That was the plan. Uh, that was 30 years ago. Things changed, they only sold about a third of those amenity trees, so it's a, it's a right mismatch of stuff going on in there. Um, but we visited there in May, and we stepped into it, and it's a woodland. It's, it's just a woodland. Like, the trees are planted in rows, but it's a woodland. Like, it's so, so dense, the canopy cover is so dense, both from a, a kind of a legal conventional po convention point of view, as well as just a, a feel for the area, it's a woodland. Um, so we talked to them about this and said, you really need to be managing this and pruning it, unsurprisingly. And good Lord, the, uh, the farmer listened. Um, and he's been brilliant at sending us lots and lots of updates. Uh, so in July, they started a formative pruning um, work. Um, and if you can just make that out on this side, they have pruned them. And they've pruned, with, you know, I think that's maybe about four to five, maybe six meters high. And that's really all we're talking about. You know, we're talking about that kind of height, which is very easily doable. You do not need specialist kit. You just need a silky store on an extendable pole, about 150, 200 quid, get six meter one. I'm, I'm nearly two meters. You know, I could get, you know, way high. But even if you're not as tall as that, you can, you'll happily, happily prune up to six meters. And that's all we're really looking for, for quality timber and um, managing that light level. So they started doing that. They started to manage it. And then, at the very beginning of August, they finished, and that you can, you can kind of see, they've done it. It's massively opened up the, what was a woodland. It is, I'd still class it as a woodland, but they've massively opened it up, um, so much so that they managed to get a hay cut off it just before the weather turned in August. Um, and they're now gonna keep on top of their management. They're putting the cattle back into the woods. Well, I say woods. It's not woods, but it is woods. Um, but they're starting to introduce cattle back in there and looking to get a hay cut out of it as well. Um, and that just, that's the power of pruning. Uh, and if that's the only thing you take away from today, I'm very happy. And then uh, last couple of things I wanted to talk about. This is a site down in Devon. And I just think it's a really interesting way at how we could potentially like, manage a lot of these systems in the future. So this lad, this is a 50 acre field we're looking at here. Um, it's owned by the Dartington Estate. They have a tenant farmer on it. Uh, he does uh, cattle. Um, and then they got a subtenant, the Apricot Centre, to sublease these rows. So these rows are four metres wide, if I remember correctly. Um, so the farmer has lost a, a percentage of the field, not a huge percent, but the farmer is no longer paying the rent for that percentage of field, but the farmer is also gaining, or his cattle I should say, are gaining all the benefit of the shade and shelter provided by these uh, rows of trees. Now these rows are a mixture of, um, there's some willow in there for, gra for, bra uh, for browsing, sorry, by the livestock, but it's predominantly elder and another fruit tree that I can't remember. And the Apricot Centre produced cordials out of it. So it's a lucrative business for the Apricot Centre. So they're creating these cordials. cordials. The farmer is benefit, or the farmer's livestock are benefiting from having this system in, but the farmer has none of the management costs or responsibilities or risks with this system. All of that is taken on by the Apricot Centre. I just think it's a really, really interesting model of management that um, I would love to encourage to be done elsewhere. Um, a lot of farmers, I, I'm surprised, I speak to a lot of farmers in my job, and majority of them aren't interested in being foresters, and that is absolutely fine. I am not here to turn anyone into a forester. If there is a farmer that wants to learn more and they want to manage the system themselves um, and do all the work themselves, they'll get no bigger um, cheerleader than me. 
and I will help as much as I can. But most farmers aren't interested. So to be realistic, a lot of these systems are going to be managed by contractors or a farmer teams up with someone who's interested in running a system and getting, the, you know, getting a, a product out of it, whether that's fruit, whether that's timber, firewood, coppice, whatever that might be. And they work collaboratively to manage these systems on the farm and the farm will still gain the benefit from it. Um, and then my very last slide is just about help and guidance that's available. Um, this isn't all of it. This is just what I thought was reasonable to put on a slide. Um, uh, the Agroforestry Handbook by the Soil Association released 2019, single best thing out there for any UK agroforestry. It's an absolutely incredible uh, font of knowledge. Um, unfortunately, physical copies don't exist anymore. I'm very lucky that I got one. Um, but you can get a free PDF of it off their website. It's absolutely amazing. If that's the only thing you look at, you're 90% you're of the way there. Um, part of my role with the, uh, the grant schemes, which I mentioned were coming out next year, um, I'm designing and creating a lot of guidance and training for agroforestry for England, not only to go alongside the, the grant schemes, how to work them, but just how to generally have, design and manage agroforestry. Um, a lot of that will be coming out next year in time with the grant schemes. Uh, Land Workers Alliance have got some really great resources. A key one though is the Promise of Agroforestry, where you've got eight case studies from around the UK of existing agroforestry. Um, another really great one is the Cutting Edge Report that came out earlier this year, and it shows a lot of human scale, wood uh, and timber based industries, how they work, kind of cost breakdowns, how many employees they got, what their turnover is. It's really good at opening your eyes at what a successful wood based business can be. Um, and then if you're interested in opening your woodlands up to grazing for livestock, Scottish Forestry got a brilliant woodland grazing toolbox. You work through it, ignore the bit about Scottish grants, unless you're in Scotland obviously, um, but you come out of it with a really brilliant woodland grazing plan. It's a great resource um, and I'm trying to copy it for England because it's really good. Um, and other than that, it's, it's now the Q&A session with myself and Pete. Um, our contact details are there. Sorry Pete, I put your number up. Um, am I? But um, yeah, if there are any questions, or if not, don't worry.